Okay, let's begin. I'm gonna bring this music down. And even though the animation's still running, I want to just start this. Let's do this. Are you ready, folks? Are you ready to <laughs> make a painting? Okay. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we're going to be making another painting by another one of my very favorite artists, but as is generally always the case, I'm certainly not alone. Today's artist is one of the most beloved artists, also arguably one of the most controversial artists, um, one of the most uh, despised artists at a certain point in his t in a time, towards the end of his life, but has since become, as I said, one of the most beloved, t for me personally, a huge inspiration. And I'm so excited to present Philip Gustin for us today. So let's take a look at his art here in a second um, and, and talk a little bit about who this great artist is. So Philip Gustin is actually born and uh, in Montreal, Canada. I think he, he left uh, him and his, his parents and he had, he had two or three brothers and sisters. They moved from Montreal to Los Angeles, I think at age six. And while he's in Los Angeles, he becomes friends with Jackson Pollock. Jackson Pollock was a classmate of his in high school. And um, and that relationship that they have is becomes a very important later on in his life. And what's so interesting is they, even though they kind of go their own ways, Jackson Pollock moves to New York shortly thereafter. Um, both of them end up meeting again in New York and and really become the stars of what is becomes known as the Abstract Expressionist Art Movement. And then in 19, well, kind of the mid-1960s, Philip Guston does the unforgivable where after painting as an abstract painter for about 14, I guess, years or so throughout most of the 50s and six, early 60s, he completely abandons abstract painting and starts making these bizarre cartoony paintings, two of which we're going to paint two paintings today because I think they're so bizarre and fabulous and weird and and uh, and also really probably among his most recognizable artworks. So here's one of the paintings we're going to make. It's this hand reaching from the heavens and drawing a line onto some unknown surface. Is it a hand making a, an artwork? Is it the hand of God reaching down and creating life as we know it? A lot of these artworks are, are, are um, ambiguous as to what their meaning is. And then this work, which arguably might be his most famous work, The Studio, from 1969, at the very beginning of this switch from abstract painting to cartoony painting, where um, he he's many people believe this is a self-portrait of him in the studio. And... Uh, we'll talk about why he's wearing this hood, uh, because he... Well, we'll talk about all that, because this is really the source of a great deal of controversy. Now, right off the top, if, if there's people who are wondering, was Philip Guston a rabid, hateful, racist human being who's depicting and glorifying the Ku Klux Klan? No. No. Is he using the, the, the hood of the Ku Klux Klan in his artwork? Yes, he is. But pretty much for the exact opposite reason some people believe he did. So I'll just put that out front because I know some people are going to be immediately turned off by this type of image. Um, but talking about all of this stuff in his work I think is what's really important. And I think ultimately what we're going to end up talking about is this incredible sense of bravery that he had 
to tackle some of these themes such as racism and oppression, white supremacy in his artwork. Okay, so um, before we continue on, I want to let you know that there's outlines for both of these paintings and they're in a Dropbox folder. So you'll see both of these images and you can take them and you can print them out and ideally you're going to transfer them onto a canvas like I'm going to do here in just a couple of minutes. So I'll show you where you can find these images. There's a link down below for a Dropbox folder, and you'll see in the Dropbox folder there's all sorts of artwork here. We got Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. I, I pointed out to most people right off the bat because it's probably the most famous artwork in the world, and it's I show people how to paint the Mona Lisa as well as Salvador Dali uh, painting an eagle with Robert Bateman. Uh, we did a whole Asian History Month a few months ago, and so you can paint some of the titans of Chinese and Japanese art. Um, what's another? Here's if you're interested in uh, hockey, which has been in the news just over the past few days with the expansion of the new Seattle team. There's a couple of hockey-themed artworks. Um, and here's where we are today. Philip Guston. I'll also let you know there's two other classes or courses that I'm doing. One is all about images from the news and tomorrow we're going to be painting a painting of the greatest soccer player who ever lived you might be thinking, is that pele ronaldo lionel messi no it's not even a man it's a woman and she's a canadian her name is christine sinclair and yesterday she continued her rise to unheard of uh, heights where she scored her 187th goal in her 300th appearance for Team Canada at the one of the very first events of the 2020 Olympic Games. I know it's 2021. In, in five years when people watch this video, they'll be like, no, no, he means the 2021 Olympics, not because it like <laughs> that's you can look it up on uh, on the web you'll find it's it's an odd scenario but anyway so here we're going to click into the Philip Guston folder and um, you're going to see there's six files in here really there's three files for each of the two paintings right so for this the the line painting there's two versions of the outline one's a PDF and one's a JPEG and for the studio, there is, again, a PDF and a JPEG of the outline. So um, just before I move on here, I just want to kind of mention that there is a private Facebook group just for people watching me right now. You can upload your version of today's paintings, where you can upload one version of that. And then every month or so, we do an episode where I give you feedback on your artwork. And so that will be coming up in a few more weeks. We'll do another one of those. Um, and oh, that's super cool. Here's Deborah's um, granddaughter made one of this is a painting we made in the Paint the News. We, did, we painted uh, a sea turtle, which are endangered species. And hopefully, Morgan uh, lives a nice long life, and our sea turtles are right there for her and her grandchildren to enjoy as well. So, uh, we'll take anyway. So, I would strongly recommend if you're watching right now and you haven't joined the group, join the group. It's a fantastic community. I'm less on there than I used to be, but that what's great is there's now there's like five new people joined up yesterday, and it's a, such a beautiful supportive group. I saw there was one person who just joined. Sorry, I was scroll down here. Look at this. Here's Susie, and she's right here at the beginning. So some of you who've been painting with me for months and months and months now. Do you remember what it was like when you made that painting together? This was, I think, in, this might have been episode number one, right? And now think about what kind of paintings you're able to do today, right? And how exciting it is to just think about the journey that we've been on together and how much your skills have improved. So anyway, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Philip Guston's art and techniques as we go here. But what I want to begin with is starting to do the outlines because that's going to take us about 10 minutes to, to uh, get done. So um, yesterday we did a painting um, for in our new series called Paint Arcade and we did a painting based on the Fortnite character Raven and so that that video is there on the uh, 
on YouTube. You can watch it for free. Uh, it took about four hours to do, but I gotta say, it's one of, I think, the best paintings that I've done in through the all of these episodes so far. So, if you're looking to really blow away some of your younger friends and family and make a painting based on Fortnite, which is the biggest, pretty much one of the biggest money-earning things in the world, not just video games or pieces of entertainment, but... Uh, that would be something probably would blow your grandkids' minds if you did a Fortnite painting. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I've I've got these. These are nine by twelve sized canvases. I'm going to paint two of them, as I said, and I ordered these off of Amazon. They're actually a little bit. They're they come out to about a dollar ninety each. And they are significantly superior to the ones that are one dollar that you get at the dollar store. Not that the, the dollar store ones are you can't use them, but these are far superior. So if you want to spend an extra ninety cents and get ten times the quality, that would be my recommendation. There is a link below. Okay, so I give it a little sanding. Because I want the smoothest surface possible to paint on. I'm not... I I, uh, I would say most professional artists probably do this. Probably a lot of beginner artists don't. You can see all that dust powder coming up. It's probably not a good thing for me to inhale. So let's... Instead of wiping it away, and i got my fan on here, blowing it right into my face... Not something I want to be inhaling, so let's just use a cloth and wipe it down. Okay, so let's tape these, let's zoom all the way out, um, these images onto the paper. Oh, and that's upside down. <laughs> I kind of like it up that way, though. It kind of is kind of neat. Let's see. I think that one works pretty well right in the middle. Sometimes the image will, you know, you've seen me probably move the paper up or down or to the side for various different reasons. I think these are both pretty good. Uh, if anything, maybe this one could go a little bit further down. Okay. You know, as a total aside, I went to um, a store here in Canada called Canadian Tire, and I bought this roll of tape for six bucks or six fifty. On Amazon, it's like fourteen dollars. <laughs> so one of the th I just as I mention that because often, you know, I there's some links below for Amazon things, and if you live in an isolated place, that might be the only way you can get certain products. But I do certainly suggest you do your own research and, and before you click buy now on your shopping cart, you might be paying two or three times the amount for the same product uh, just for the convenience of having it delivered to your house. And if you don't have Prime, you're paying on top of that as well, right? So, let's... I'm just getting an extra pencil out here because sometimes I break these pencils when I'm doing these outlines. I'm going to endeavor to do this pretty darn quick. Um, so just going to get the basic shapes of some of these clouds out here. Really the outer shape is what's most important to me personally. And we are going to, I think, paint kind of thick today. I don't know what it is about Montreal artists. <laughs> Just the other day we did a painting by Marcel Ferron, who was one of the great abstract painters in Canadian history, one of the most influential um, female artists of her time, certainly in Quebec. And she painted pretty thick, goopy, abstract paintings. Not too dissimilar from the kind of stuff Philip Gustin made 
before he started making these in the late 1960s. Uh, although m m many of her paintings were done with a palette knife, and so if you've never used a palette knife, that might be a good episode to explore. Okay. Now this horizon line is crooked. And you've probably heard me say at times that it kind of drives me crazy when horizon lines are crooked. Uh, because, it, I don't know, it probably brings out some ADD or something in me. And uh, so I'm going to suggest when I paint that this horizon line, I might... Uh, you know, um, either straighten it up or make it even more crooked. Um, also, just by the way, I don't know if I mentioned, I'm using carbon paper to do this. You can use graphite paper. This 12, I think I bought this for like three or four dollars at the local corner store. You can get it, it should be available at most art supply stores. Again, if not, there's an Amazon link down below for that. Um, but, uh, you can also buy carbon paper at many fabric stores because people use it for um, applying tracing patterns onto fabric. Okay, so again, just quickly getting this down because we're gonna when we paint over some of this, we're gonna lose a lot of detail. And I think we're probably going to approach this painting a little bit differently than we have some previous paintings. So, um, I'm looking forward to that. I've been a big Philip Guston fan since probably I was in my early 20s. And he, he is a big, you know, he's kind of a hero to a lot of younger artists because of his uh, fearlessness to change his style completely not once but twice and I think we'll, we'll talk I'll show you some images of his work uh, from those two or three very different eras um, of his life and why he decided to adopt this imagery which has become very controversial and so much so that even 40 years after he died Recently, one of his exhibitions, a big major retrospective of his artwork, was postponed originally to 2024 because the curators were so fearful of the backlash of exhibiting these paintings that they didn't even want to think about it. Um, and then the cancelling of those exhibitions in and of itself <laughs> caused a huge amount of controversy. Um, so, it's tough to be a curator. <laughs> Lots of different opinions um, in the art world. And quite frankly, also a lot of opinions from people who don't really understand what this art is all about. Okay, I think that's, that's good enough. Um, so, let's prime these canvases. Okay, let's, so, we take this off you can see what that looks like we take that off you see what that looks like now that i see it maybe i could have moved that hand over to the right but uh okay the other thing too is this carbon paper it can last for about 20 or 30 tracing so don't throw it out just yet you should be able to get lots of use out of that material. Okay. So, with these two paintings, what I'm going to do is... Let's just actually take a, a quick look at these images again. I, I think I'm going to uh, use my um, typical approach, which I'm going to put a warm yellow on both of these surfaces right off the bat. And so let's get some paint out of this box. All the material that I use for these classes can fit inside of a shoebox. 
And I think that's really important to remember that you don't need, you know, to to invest in in dozens and dozens of different tubes of paint. In fact, I only use eight tubes of paint. And I've painted most of the greatest artworks in that have been made, at least since the Renaissance, um, using this very simple palette. Really, one of the things that I've been doing, or at least I didn't even really think, I didn't even know what I was doing when I began these live streams right before the pandemic hit. Like, talk about good timing. Um, but this is really, it's, this whole series of videos has been an attempt for really for me to prove that my system of painting actually works. And it can work for uh, beginner artists and intermediate artists, and quite frankly, even professional advanced artists. At the very least, gives advanced artists a pretty good idea, or your maybe intermediate artists of how how to get to that next stage of the of your development as an artist. So. I mix, this is just the warm yellow right out of the tube. All of these colors are, um, uh, are e should be very easily available at any art supply store. And in the very first video in my intro to painting class, I, I even show the different brands of paint and how you could get these six colors from any brand of paint it doesn't have to be this Amsterdam paint uh, it could be Golden or Windsor and Newton I think they make acrylic don't they or are they just oil paint now that I think about it. Um, yeah whatever brand it is PBO everyone makes this uh, very simple set of colors. In fact, I'd be interested to know in the chat, those of you that are watching right now, what brand of paint do you use to make these paintings? You know, there's about a hundred, 150 people who watch these videos, usually within the first couple of days, and I'm so interested to know how people are making the artwork that they're making. Are you using the same materials that I'm using, or have you got a modified system for doing it? Uh, I, one thing I, I think about all the time, and is if you're watching me for the very first time, especially if this video has been pre-recorded, or it's been recorded and you're watching it at another time, go, go to the very end. Take a look at the painting as it stands, and decide for yourself whether you want to make it. Because um, some people are pretty skeptical along the way, and they're like, yeah, I don't know, if, I don't know about that, it's what he's doing there, I don't think that's going to work, that's a pretty dumb idea. And, you know, by the end of the painting, I, I hopefully redeem myself and, and make a pretty good argument for the choices that I've made throughout. Although, um, just as a reminder, like, it is worth noting that there are many, many different ways to make a painting. And I don't claim to be the, the, the keeper of of all knowledge and that if anybody uses a different technique or process then they're wrong unlike some other people on YouTube um, I, I think it's actually I, I watch I love watching videos by other artists teaching how they did what they do they do it's always interesting to me to see the different strategies that artists adopt um, okay so I'm going to blow dry these really quickly because <clears throat> they're both wet. One of the reasons I put water in here is that it does speed up the drying process. So I'm going to mute the microphone just for two.
so it's a little bit still wet on the sides and back not surprising because it might be a little bit thicker and also not getting the full blast of the the uh, air the the machine that blows hot air the hair dryer uh, I just see a couple questions in the chat or Joshua says uh, oh my question about what kind of paint do you use Joshua says for me I use two brands I use Master Touch acrylic and oil. It's a Hobby Lobby brand. And I also use Windsor & Newton acrylic. Very interesting. Um, some of those like inexpensive brands you can get from like Michaels. I think they have their own proprietary brand. I'm trying to remember what they are called. I have some of it. Oh yeah, it says Artist's Loft. I think Michaels makes Artist's Loft. Um, I'm not familiar with the Master Touch, but I think, you know, some of those brands, you know, um, are pretty good, especially for a beginner artist, because it's also nice to use less expensive materials when you're starting so that you don't feel like you're wasting expensive paint, um, even though you shouldn't feel that way. But I know what it's like, you know, if you're, you're already a little bit anxious when you begin painting and then you're using expensive materials and it doesn't turn out the way you want, you're like, oh. Well, I just might as well burn my money in the fireplace instead of making these junk paintings, right? So if you're using cheap paint, the stakes go down. Like you feel like, ah, well, there's maybe like, what, $3 worth of materials there. I, I probably have more change that I lose out of my pockets in the couch, you know? So then you just feel like, well, if it didn't turn out, then all I've lost is a little bit of time, but I've probably gained some knowledge along the way. Joshua also asks, also a quick question, how do I use carbon graphite paper and not lose the tracing when I'm doing a yellow ochre layer for acrylic painting? Um, well, I, what I would do is, is use something that's a, like a darker graphite and you can also press much harder on it. You could even do the outline onto the, to the board and then, or canvas, and then outline it again with, um, with, another pencil or you could use we've we've done this a few times where we've done just like this and then we've taken a dark color and quickly painted it over that so i think an episode where we did just that was the berta moriso painting um of the it's a vase of flowers we did that i don't know back in september october of last year uh, but we did uh, we did just ex i think exactly i think that if you watch that episode Berta Morisot. In fact, I'll just uh, let me see if I can just dig it up for you, so you have an idea. So this is the painting that we made, um, and we put down a, a uh, I think a yellow just like this, and then the very first things we took a, a some dark paint and did some of the outlining right over top of it so we wouldn't lose some of that shape. Great question. Thanks, Joshua. Um, good to see you again. And I'm looking forward to see what kind of paintings you make today because I think you might really like this kind of big, thick, wet type of painting. So I think let's begin with this image. It might be a little bit simpler and maybe even a little bit less controversial for some people who, are, who get worked up by the work of... Um, of Philip Guston. In fact, maybe just I'll take a couple seconds here. Just let's just talk a little bit. Let's look at his work and think. One of the so Philip Guston, as I said, born in Montreal, moves to Los Angeles at age six. Los Angeles at the time, um, in we're talking like 1930s, uh, 19. Well, would he would have moved there? Let's see, when was he born? 1913 so like 1920 when he got there think about like all of the great film noir films sort of take place in 1930s 1940s early 50s a lot of them in Los Angeles Los Angeles in that post war post war or between the war period of time was um a, a, a kind of a dangerous place, which is why like a lot of crime dramas take place during that time, um, and uh, a time where racism was really 
omnipresent. And Philip Guston was was a born Jewish uh, and well, born and died Jewish, um, but uh, he, you know, coming being a Jewish person living anywhere in the world in the 1930s. You know, there's obviously, you know, we're leading up to World War II and and Nazi Germany and the Holocaust and that anger against not just the Jewish people but people anyone who wasn't Aryan was pervasive around the Western world, right? There were there was a Nazi party in the United States that was getting pretty big until uh, the late 1930s, right? So. That um, the 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 even the 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 LAPD, for instance, the Los Angeles Police Department was essentially completely corrupt and was would uh, had had many people from the KKK that it infiltrated uh, the the LA Police Department, right? So you had this police department that was essentially a a gang, a racist gang that was running the that massive city and so it wasn't uncommon for uh, the police to beat people up and and or you know lynch people I mean you there all of this is online it's all documented I'm not inventing anything it's not conspiracy theories there's plenty of information out there that talks about this um, so much so that one of the images that so the, the, the KKK is sort of this omnipresent pr presence in, in life in, throughout many parts of the United States and even Canada at this time. And um, so uh, Philip Guston sees people proudly walking around town, parading around with their KKK uh, hoodies and garbs. And it, it would be very terrifying for anyone who wasn't you know, Caucasian, and um, he saw people being lynched, mostly black people being lynched, but he would also have to fear for himself walking around. So the, these images of the hooded, menacing KKK figures um, become a part of his early work, so much so that he, he makes a large painting uh, that features the KKK lynching people, and the LAPD shoot through the window of the gallery and destroy that painting right uh, so he's I mean this is not just an abstract fear of his in the back of his mind he is seeing it happen right and he feels that fear that that group is instilling within the local population right so that those that particular set of imagery goes into his mind and stays there throughout his life I think it's also interesting around that, I think when he's a, uh, age 10, his father, who struggled for work, was an alcoholic himself, commits suicide, and so he's now being raised by his mother and his, his brothers, I think he had a, maybe one sister, um, and around, I think he's in his late teens, his oldest brother is dies after a car accident, complications from an accident, his legs are essentially paralyzed and dies of gangrene. And uh, both all his mother, like so, he he falls into a huge depression and he just can't live in Los Angeles. He moves. To, he he writes to his old high school buddy um, Jackson Pollock and is like, "I got to get out of town." He moves to New York City and becomes good friends. He literally stays with Jackson Pollock um, and his family in New York City. And he's introduced to a whole new group of, of friends. And uh, so these are... And, and what, before he moved there, he was making these large mural, mural paintings. These kind of like Cubist-inspired images. And then once he gets to New York, you know, again, he's living with Jackson Pollock. And you can see the influence that Pollock has on Guston, right? Very quickly, uh, he starts adopting this abstract style. You could, again, Jackson Pollock is the artist who did the drip paintings. Um, and so he, he adopts this style for all of the 1950s and going into the 1960s. And he becomes, alongside 
Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning, Mark Rothko, um, Barnett Newman, Robert Motherwell, Elaine de Kooning, um, uh, he be France Klein. He becomes synonymous with those artists, and, uh, and he's exhibiting with them. He's good friends with them. They're all drinking buddies. They're the they used to always go to this one place called the Cedar Tavern in Lower Manhattan, kind of uh, in the near the Lower East Side area, and they are all big drinkers, all certified alcoholics, right? And uh, and that eventually takes the life of many of them. They're all very dour, grumpy, older guys by this time, right? In the mid-1950s, he's in his late 40s, right? Or mid-40s. And so, but, and you can watch, there's some great documentaries, actually. I'll just kind of point these out here. You can you can watch these. I highly recommend them. This one is like, what, 30 minutes long. It's all about Philip Guston's life. Um, and here's, this is his daughter. He had one, one child. And then here's another little bit of a longer documentary uh, that has a lot of him actually talking about his work. So I strongly recommend watching these two documentaries. Um, but he, he ends up in the 1960s, a very chaotic time in, in global history, but particularly the United States. And he becomes very disillusioned with um, with art and with society and culture, and he he sees like every night on the news race riots, police brutality. He sees the war in Vietnam. He sees like uh, um, people protesting all various different kinds of things, shootings on campuses, and then he goes back to a studio and he talks about in that documentary. I, how I, I can't how do I just go back to to my studio and just paint these abstract paintings it seems silly it seems like he wanted his artwork to have some kind of ability to make some social change and his earlier work before he went abstract he was painting murals he went to Mexico and painted murals and became acquainted with some of the famous artists Diego Rivera and Alfred Sesqueros Frida Kahlo and who were all very political, very active in the, the political scene in Mexico. And then he's, he finds himself in New York making these abstract paintings, and he's like, you know what, this is ridiculous. Like, I, like what am I doing with myself? And he descends into this alcohol-fueled depression. He's cheating on his wife. He's, he's got all sorts of mystery. It's just a disaster. And... Mean, and he starts ex experimenting in the studio, making a lot of these small, weird paintings of books and shoes. And the images start coming back from when he was in his teens and early 20s, those images of the KKK. And and he's, he tries to, to repress some of that stuff. He's like, I'm an abstract painter. What are my friends? My entire community paints this way. And yet he can't stop it, and he keeps painting these paintings. And eventually, I think it's 1970, there's a, a gallery in uh, New York uh, called the Marlboro Gallery, which is a, a major, one of the biggest galleries in the world these days, most powerful galleries. And he exhibits these paintings of these cartoony figures, these hooded figures, and the art world goes wild. People are his friends. There's in that documentary, you know, it talks about Willem de Kooning, one of the most powerful abstract expressionists who ever lived, most important American artist of all time, walking through the gallery and just being like, this is a disaster. This guy is has just lost his mind and is about to ruin his career. And some of those friends stop talking to him. They're like, whatever he's doing right now is this is not what an artist should be doing. And you can see, if we're looking at all this work, they are weird, strange <laughs> paintings. And you got to be like, what on earth is he thinking? And he dies in 1980. You know, this documentary right here is filmed pretty much like weeks, literally weeks before he died. I think he died of a heart attack, probably right after this was filmed. Like, I think this he's in this documentary, he's hanging this retrospective. 
and um, I think a couple weeks after the retrospective opens, he dies. Anyway, um, so let's now make this painting as we kind of transition from talking a little bit about him. And we'll talk more about that controversial work. There's some great links that are in the description below, which I'll also talk about maybe in between these two paintings. Although I might work on both of these simultaneously. Once I've got a color mixed, I'm probably going to slap it on both here as we go here. So let's uh, let's put some paint on the palette here. And we're probably going to be using a little bit more paint than we have in the past. As I said, this is um, you know, a kind of a feature of the abstract expressionist painters is this kind of wild sense of abandon. They're um, they are not concerned about being careful, and uh, they are are like letting loose. And so it is. He, he even though the the work looks very different from the mid 1960s forward, I think many of the same approaches to painting in terms of how the handling paint stays very much the same which is I think pretty interesting um, okay so one more squeeze there we go lots of paint on there and oh I for, let's put these labels uh, I usually do this earlier but let's put these on now this also just helps me remember when I'm talking about paint um, what we're doing here. Okay, so <clears throat> we've got our six colors here, two yellows, two reds, two blues, and one is warm and one is cool with each of those colors. So what should be the first thing we do? Usually what we do is we start in the background and move to the foreground. So in the first image there's some of this uh, cool blue so we're just going to paint some cool blue right in the background and get that started so actually let's just we'll use this big brush that we used to do the yellow on the background I'm just going to wipe off some of the excess water there and okay Where's this view? Here we are. Okay, so let's get some of that blue on our brush. And let's scoop some of the white out here. In fact, I think we're going to need a lot of it. Okay. And maybe I'm going to put even more white in here and one of the ways that that artists like him painted is you could see that I didn't bother mixing this up really really well right I'm, I do a, a, an okay job but the point is not we want a little bit of the look of, of paint that is that's got several different um, that we can see the other colors that might be mixed in there and it can be pretty hard to let yourself um, leave unmixed paint on the canvas so that's this is going to be a bit of a challenge for some of you so we're putting this on Right, my instinct is to really clean some of this up. I'm just gonna let it stay just like that. So potentially I may not need to do a second coat of paint here. We'll see how it turns out by the time I got...
Okay. As long as the the white of the canvas is covered, I think I'm gonna leave it like that. Nice thick use of paint. I love it. In fact, I've got a bit left over. I'm just gonna put some of that leftover paint on here. And if I paint over some of these lines on the arms and stuff, that's fine. Even this line down here, I think that's good. So how about let's go up into the cloud right now. And uh, let's continue. Actually, I'm going to... Let's just take some of this excess paint off this brush. I'm just going to wipe that extra paint off and then put that in the water. And then let's go down to a smaller brush. And I'm going to take a bit of the warm blue cold blue and mix these together a bit. And I'm also going to take some white. Okay, get some of that on here. And then I'm literally just going to start painting right in here. Right, talk about this is very different than we've made some of our paintings recently, right? Where we're kind of more patient. I'm using the the hair dryer to speed some of the drying up. Not today. We're looking at a very different approach to painting. Okay, then let's get maybe a bit more white on here. You can see my brush is, let's, in fact, let's zoom in a bit. I've got like just gooey paint on here. Now I think his background is definitely a little bit lighter, has more white in it than mine, but I don't mind that at least at this stage here. I might lighten it up. Okay. In fact, let's. I'm going to take a bit more white. I'm just going to mix, put some of this white in here. more white on my brush. Okay. Now, he's painting with oil paints, which are going to take a long time to dry. I am painting with acrylic paint, so I'm, I'm less... Depending, the, the, this paint will, will dry very quickly, and I'm just going to let it dry kind of quickly, um, as opposed, to, you could put some medium in there, I do have slow dry medium right here, but um, I, rather than using that, I am going to, sort of, I'm using a little bit of a modified version of his process here. So... Let's see, we're looking at his, this arm. 
Maybe what I'll do next is, let's zoom back out, oops. I'm gonna mix the warm red at the bottom down here. And that uh, warm red, because we've got cool blue in the background, we want a warm red so that it pulls the, the ground up closer to us. So I'm gonna take some of this, this red right here. I'm gonna take just a little bit of the cool red and mix this in here a little bit. And let's zoom out a bit. So I'm just going to put this in here kind of quickly. And I'm going to make a point of maybe going up a little bit higher. Now you see the the overlapping of the of the red on top of the blue creates a bit of a line there. I kind of like that, but I if I don't like it, I could subsequently put a lighter blue over top and just clean that up. So I think I'm just going to embrace it for now. I can always there's lots of different solutions to paint that out, but I kind of like it. So, we'll just leave that here I'm probably gonna have to do another pass at some of those colors. Um, so maybe just while we're right here, if we just take a look at this painting and think, is there, can we get this one going as well with the color I just have on my brush right here? I think I'm gonna do that. I think I'm going to let this uh, cool down for a minute. Um, Here's, here's this big stack of, these are all the gesso paintings. This is for the next month of painting that I got ready to go. So, we'll put this to the side here. And we'll get this one going. We'll zoom out. So, um, I'm going to take... Uh, we need some white. And I'm going to take this red and white and kind of mix it in very loosely. And then let's just start painting here. Definitely a little bit too pinkish there. So let's paint this more pinkish color down here. Maybe it also needs to go a little bit more white. So this one is not was too light for here and not light enough for down there. So just take some more white, put that on my brush. Right, it already kind of feels like I want it, you know, I, we, we're trying to encourage some of this uh, the brushiness that he's got going on here. You see I painted over this light bulb. Very easy to bring that kind of thing back. I 
And this is just, this is a, a cool, this is, well, it's a little bit of, this might be even a little bit too warm of a, of a pink. So I'm just going to paint this in. And then I think I might modify it with a little bit more magenta, a little bit more of a cool pink. So let's just do that right now. I'm going to take some of this cool pink and some white. And let's just paint over some of this. Right, have we ever, have we made a painting like this yet? No. Not like, not as gooey and wet and free. Okay, and I think it, you know it's not quite light enough, but I'm gonna let it dry like this, and then we can always put some more white over top of that in a short bit, and just get it even more like that. Okay, so I'm gonna let's just get some of that paint off. I'm actually just going to take my rag and just wipe off the excess, but not clean the brush thoroughly. And let's just take some of the warm red. Maybe it does need a little bit of white, so just take a bit of white in there. So don't don't overwork some of this, right? You want to be painting quickly. You don't want to be laboring over details. You want this to be moving quickly, right? If you're painting with um, oil paints. It's a, obviously a totally different experience. Uh, this is this kind of warm red again. So let's just keep on zipping around here on the painting. Nice goopy paints. I'll just paint right over that. Um, this hand. You can see the size of brush that I'm using too. Big thick brush. Right, so this is also going to help me, prevent me from getting too mired into the details here. Okay. Let's see, when I I'm not even going to bother trying to touch all that up. I'm just going to keep on plowing forward here. Some more warm red. All right, big big thing is the speed here. I know I'm saying it over and over, but I know that some of you are going to be slaboring over and trying to get perfection. That's sort of antithetical to the whole way that Philip Guston made his his art. Okay, so. Um, that off and then just clean that some excess off while we think about the next step here so how about we'll just let's just see these two paintings side by side so we see where we're at 
Okay. So, you know, what we we've been painting for maybe 20 minutes and now we've got the basics of both of these paintings begun and um where should we do now? I think I'm going to just keep on working on this for a second because I'm going to mix an orange 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 and then paint white in I guess there's a bit of blue here. Let's paint even just paint that blue right now. Okay. It's almost kind of fun to to paint these like this. Like when I'm painting on my own, this is sort of like my this is the way that I would be painting. If I didn't have a camera watching me, I would just have both of these simultaneously. I would paint a little bit here, do a little bit there, rather than ro even rotating them in and out. But, and I've, I mentioned this a number of times, but I love working in that in this particular way because it helps me get out of my head. Because it's it's very it's it's impossible to focus on two paintings at the same time. So having. Um, uh, those two paintings going on sort of just forces me to just uh, have a little bit of reckless abandon, which when we're painting a painting like this is exactly what we want. So let's see. The next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to mix up some uh, warm orange. So let's take a bit of red and some orange and just mix this together. I think we need a bit more. Okay. And again, don't worry about getting it all perfectly mixed. We're going to do this right here on the canvas itself. And if we want to lighten it up, just grab another color, throw it right in there. You want to darken it, grab a little bit more red, throw it in there. Don't worry about mixing it on the palette. Keep on going. It should feel like a little bit of, there should be some urgency in the way that we're painting these paintings today. We should feel like we're going a little bit faster than feels comfortable. Right, if I was in a classroom and we were all sitting together, I'd be wandering around the room and I'd be standing right next to you and go, faster, paint this next thing. Do it, 10 seconds, you got 10 seconds, otherwise I'm kicking you out of the class, go. <laughs> right, it'd be a little bit like a uh, tyrannical dictator. Some people probably already think I'm, I'm like that a little bit in some of my classes, but sometimes you need that little bit of a kick in the butt in order to to get things done. Okay, I love that goopy goopiness. Okay, so got this orange. I'm just gonna rub the excess off here. What did I say we're gonna do next? Uh, the white, that white. Um, I'm not even gonna bother cleaning this brush. I'm just gonna take the white right out of off of here, and then let's just. Put it on. Now you're saying like, oh, this has got like some pink in there. Oh, I'm painting over the eyes. Oh no, what's going on? What a disaster. Don't worry, I'm just going to go right over all of this here. I'm just going to paint all those lines out. I'm still using a, a big wide brush for this. In fact, let's just keep on going. Let's take all this down, paint all the 
yellow out. How's everybody doing out there? How do you feel painting a painting like this at the speed that we're painting it at in? Am I driving you absolutely nuts? Are you able to get any of this done? Open the clock. I'm gonna. Pr I'm going to be painting some of this white back in, or on top, of all of this anyway. So don't worry if it gets a little bit muddy and gross, and colors are mixing. If anything, that's like right out of the Philip Guston playbook, right? Um. Okay. Oh, and then there was this area here. this light bulb. I think I'll wait till this is a little bit more dry before I go in there. And just sort of now that I've got this paint before I wash my brush, I'm just going to go back in with a little bit of white and a few of these places just smudge it around a bit. Okay. <laughs> I love this. I'm, I'm having a blast. I don't know about anybody else, but this is... I've been wanting to do painting like this for a long time. Uh, I'm not going to get the black out just yet. I'm going to wait for a little bit. Um, there is that green in here, which is unusual. I, I wonder, I suspect that this green would have been a late choice. Either a very early part of the painting, or a late part. So I'm just going to use some cool blue and cool yellow and paint. Come on. Here we are. Does it have to be a little bit brighter, a little bit, a uh, little bit more yellow in there? Probably. I'll come back to that later on. Though. That window just, just keep getting bigger and goopier. You betcha. Love it too. Um. Okay. So. I'm going to move this painting to the side. That's I'm we're, I'm happy with where that one got to in that period of time. I'm just going to take a second just to clean a few of these brushes cuz um, even though I've got I've got hundreds of brushes to be honest. Um, even the even then I still want to keep things relatively clean if I can help it. I find when things get too messy and chaotic, it's it just sort of I it can get a little confusing, and it also can um I can it makes me a little bit tired. I don't know about anybody else, but when there's a lot of mess around, I start to just go like, oh man, can you imagine like when this is all done? Like, oh, it's gonna take me hours to clean up. Oh, what is that? So. I don't want to. I don't want to have that kind of a distraction in mind. So if I can just 
take an extra minute here and there, tidy things up, then I can my mind can stay focused in the artwork. Okay. I'm still curious to know what kinds of paint, what brands of paint people are using out there. Um, so if you want to ask, put that in the chat, that would be awesome. You know, let's go back to... Okay. I think, you know, I, I had some of this red with some uh, white in it. I'm just going to take a bit more of that and paint this down here just to get rid of that dark line which isn't in the original and I'm also just gonna take and just kinda just scrub around here a little bit I'm gonna paint more red over top of it shortly but I, I just kinda I, I didn't like that dark line. It wasn't really part of the original. Um, so putting some white there is going to help obliterate that dark area. Um, now, this background. I think... do I Should I lighten it? I don't know. Let's paint this hand. Let's get the hand in there. And then I think it'll be pretty clear what we need to do next. So, to, to make this kind of skin tone, let's take some warm red. And some warm yellow. And actually, let's just take this uh, blue from down there. Cold blue. Actually, you know what? I just, that shouldn't be cold blue. It should have been warm blue. Hmm. I don't want that color, so I'm going to mix this again. I'm just going to wipe this paint off and let's start that again often happens right so let's take let's do this over here let's take some a little bit of warm blue not cold blue because see how gray that got I don't want it to be gray I want it to be peachy color and the the cold blue is gonna make that uh, that orange go kind of gray. All right. So let's take some white, mix this together. In fact, maybe I'll mix it a little bit more right here. And I'm just going to paint it pretty roughly into this area here. So it's not as goopy of a color as we've used in other places in this painting so far. Because I'm going to be doing a bunch of details over it, but... Uh, okay. Kind of close. So now, now that I've got this color down, it makes me think, okay, now, how do I feel again about that background? Should I lighten it up even more than it currently is? I think I will. You don't have to. You're certainly welcome to keep it as is. Um, so let's just take some white. Let's see. 
little bit closer. Okay, and then let's just paint it all in here. Again, not worrying about perfection. If anything, trying to do this in a relatively speedy manner. Okay, almost got it done. So there's a few places where some color from the hand found its way onto my brush. I don't mind that so much. Almost made it without needing more white. So close. So what's happening in a few places is that first layer of blue that I put down in the background is still not dry. So as I'm painting over it, I'm actually scooping, it's like I'm actually removing some of it. It's getting pulled up a little bit, which is a little bit, it's a little bit frustrating and ordinarily that would drive me absolutely bonkers. But in this particular style of painting, it actually kind of almost is exactly what we want. Because now we're just creating more of a dynamic kind of quality and a less unified surface. So I'm kind of right now, the paint is kind of coming up off of the background and I was just sort of trying to coax it into doing a little bit more of what I want. If, it, if I'm going to have brush strokes that are going to stay there and be seen, I want to be be sure that, that they're the brush strokes that I want there to, to stay there and be seen, right? Okay. Coolness. Oh, let's, let's. Okay. Very quiet chat today. I've never, I've never seen the chat so quiet, which is kind of funny. If you're enjoying today's episode, please like and subscribe to the channel. If you want to leave a contribution, there's a PayPal links below. There's my email, which you can contact me through if you want to send an e-transfer. And if you're watching the live stream, there's also, you can do, uh, use the super chat function and donate directly through YouTube. So if you're watching right now, hit that like button. Okay. 
Okay. What's the next step here, do you think? Looking at this one. Both of them are, are, are both, actually, let's look at them side by side again. Put this here. This one's got a lot more thick paint right now, which makes me think I should just let this dry for a few more minutes and maybe do as much as I can to, to maybe, I don't know if I'll be able to finish one this one quite yet, but just maybe get a little bit more of the hand done on here, finish the bottom and start tackling the cloud. And maybe we'll be almost done. Okay. So let's do the 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 hand. I think again. I'm just gonna um, need a bit more warm yellow. Yeah, that is like I've never seen the chat. Only two questions in the chat. Usually there's there's like dozens by at this point, but anyway. Um, so I'm just going to mix this color, maybe more yellow on here. Take some white. And then let's put them side by side. So this color has maybe a bit more yellow in it and less pink in it than my previous one. I don't know if that's a good thing. I think his actually had a bit more pink in there, but we still have some work to do. So before I'm just going to, I don't want to labor over it. I'm, I'll keep on going here. This looks like. There's the, the bone on the wrist right here. Um, okay. Maybe I'll let this dry for a couple minutes and then I'll work on the cloud right now. So let's grab um, and let's zoom in too. Ah, I see Paula in the chat chimes in. Nice to hear from you, Paula. It says, um, I've got a new set of watercolors today. I'm trying out the new paints on today's painting. Um, and too busy focused on the pain to talk. That's great. That makes me happy. Being uh, there's no such thing as being too focused on your paintings. If you're if you're focused on your paintings, that makes me happy. Okay, so I just took some uh, warm blue. This is my ultramarine blue, and I'm just gonna start kind of painting it in here. And I don't care if I start picking up other colors. Let it get a little bit gross and muddy. If you like painting uh, a painting like this, you like painting wet paint into wet paint, then you'd probably really like the experience of painting with oil paint. 
oil paint you know the painting stays wet for hours on end some people love that some people just drive some absolutely bonkers See how the paint is kind of mixing as I apply it. You know, when you're painting these clouds, don't get your, don't work yourself up. And if you're not happy with the way it's, it's, if it's not exactly like how Philip Gustin painted it, I'm certainly not concerned. I can always go back and lighten some of these lines. I will, in fact, but I just, I'm gonna use, do the whole thing with this um, darker blue. Okay, I'm just going to get a bit of white on the same brush. Let's just lighten it up a little bit. Okay. I'm going to I got a little bit Okay, I'm just going to I'll, I'll eventually work on that a bit more. So now let's just take this paintbrush. Well, it's, I've got all this paint that I just, it's sort of mixed on my brush. Uh, let's go around and, and use some of it. right off of the, basically right out of the tube and just start painting it in. I forgot how much fun this kind of, This is a lot like how I used to paint like 20 years ago. Just like really kind of unhinged, like just lead, just, just going wild with the paint. I forgot about how much fun it is to paint this way. Okay. 
Okay. You know, I'm, I'm kind of every once in a while looking up at the original image and trying to kind of think, okay, well, I guess I'll paint a little bit lighter here, a little bit darker there. But I'm not obsessed in any way whatsoever about trying to recreate, like, cloud for cloud what's going on over there. That almost seems a little bit silly. You know, it's not like I'm trying to make a forgery of any of these paintings. So I'm allow I allow myself lots of freedom to to really try to get into the mind of that artist and allow yourself to paint with maybe a little bit more freedom than you might ordinarily do. Okay, and then I'm just going to take a little bit more blue back on my brush and just sort of go back over uh, some of this wet paint and I can kind of darken some. Right, and then you can kind of go over a few of these lines. I think I'm going to let this dry. Um, and then after it's dry, I'll come back in and paint some of the other lines over top of it. So I feel really good about, about how all this looks so far. See in the chat. Oh, there's um, Maria says. Sometimes I try to put a very thick layer of paint just to paint uh, on wet on wet. Is it easier? It is easier to paint for me like that. Um. Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, there's. There, it's two different things. Some people really like this type of painting. Really like really thick paint, applying it. You can see, like, very different kinds of uh, effects than we've had, you know, when we did the Mona Lisa or some of the other paintings which are maybe more conservative in their approach to painting, much slower, like, even just the painting we made yesterday, the, the portrait of Raven from Fortnite. We did some glazing. It's pretty careful and precise. Fairly thin application of paint. Um, when you're painting a little bit thicker like this, 
it's you're you give up a bit of control right remember when i i always talk about glazing as a bit of like it's like for great for the timid painter because you can add glazing fluid and you can just paint almost invisible brush strokes whereas when we're painting thick paint like this you know you're you're jumping two feet in and you're painting and you're mixing the colors that are already there and it's gooey and very unpredictable and some people hate that because they want more control over the painting process and some people love it because they just feel like it's super liberating yeah I, it's just a totally different temperament or you know people with different temperaments are going to gravitate to different types of painting um maria also asks but i read somewhere that oil paint is toxic is that right um, good question. Uh, these days, most of the oil paint that you can buy, like, there's there's two reasons why any kind of paint could be toxic. Well, actually, three reasons. Three reasons why uh, paint can be toxic. The first reason that paint is toxic is the pigments. The, 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 the pigment, the color, if you want to think of it, the, 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 which is mostly powdered pigment these days, that can be toxic so famously cadmium is very toxic actual cadmium uh red cadmium yellow though the cadmium is um is, is a poison right and now most paint uses synthetic cadmium right is it's or it's not even it's just it it doesn't even contain cad cadmium it's made in a laboratory and looks like cadmium red or cadmium yellow um so the, in that aspect the pigment that's in virtually all paint these days is safe right because it was just too too much liability for companies to paint to make paint that could make people sick right to, to the to use pigment that could make and it was also very expensive right often you have to go and mine pigment from different places you have to get it imported. Whereas if you can just make it in a laboratory and you can make as much of it as you want for a tenth of the price, then... And not only that, um, uh, synthetic pigments tend to be uh, more light fast, meaning they don't fade in the light as much as natural pigments do. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, synthetic pigment is better than, than um, natural pigments. Of course, just like people like records over your MP3s, digital recordings, there's people who love n natural pigments. They swear that they can tell the difference, you know, just like there's people who say, oh, I can hear the music better on my records player than I can on my iPhone or iPod or digital streaming service, whatever, right? <laughs> there's people who, can you tell the difference? <sighs> maybe but it's 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 such a small i think almost in, like any I, I don't even know most people would 99.9% .9 of the people on earth would not notice any difference whatsoever so again these three <laughs> three things that that could make up uh, your art material toxic is the pigment itself the color and the pigment the next thing is, I don't want to give people a finger, the next thing that is uh, very toxic potentially is the binder, the, the mechanism that, that binds the pigment to the canvas, right? Um, in this case, we're using acrylic binder, but there's oil paint, that linseed oil is the binder in oil paint. I don't know what the binder is in, in watercolor, it's some sort of gum uh not chewing gum but it's like a it's another kind of material tempera paint is like the least toxic you know they give it to the children paint with it in elementary schools because you don't want to be drinking it or licking your brush but it's you know better than acrylic paint right it'll wash out of your eyes if you get your fingers in your eyes etc um so for the most part these days out of an abundance of caution, most of the binders are are um, um, are fairly harmless. Again, oil paint, linseed oil. Some people you cook with linseed oil, right? So you can buy it at your grocery store. Um, so linseed oil, you know, it's, again, you don't 
you probably don't want to be drinking a cup of it. You're probably frying with it or whatever. Um, is is relatively non toxic. Um, so you know it doesn't. So for the most part these days, getting if you get oil paint, artists oil paint. I don't know about house oil paint. If you get oil paint on your hands, it's not it's not that bad. You know, I used to twenty years ago put rubber gloves on when I painted with oil paint because it it could there was some still you could still buy cadmium paints and that could be very toxic. So anyway, those are all things aside. Now the last thing that could potentially be toxic is the way you clean your materials, right? With acrylic, we use water. So unless your water is poisoned, then water is is but the safest type of material you can use for cleaning your paintbrushes. I'm going on this rant when I should be doing paint. Um, so that's so water is is pretty safe and a lot of like watercolors, tempera, gouache, what did I say watercolors, acrylic, there's a lot of things that in, in fact there's now there's water soluble oil paint. So w water is the best choice for cleaning and is least toxic. A lot of people when they're painting with oil, however, used to use turpentine and turpentine is like the most toxic thing. It's it's a poison. You could kill somebody with it if you drank it. So oil paint used to be very toxic these days what we often use is do i have a container of it handy so most of the time these days artists will use this or or what's called odorless mineral spirits OMS and this is the this is the oil paint that I brand that I use gambling I've been to their, their their factory in Portland Oregon great people Scott is like an awesome person to talk to um, and uh, so it is you don't want to be drinking this stuff you don't want to be drinking your odorless mineral spirits it is toxic to an extent um, but certainly way better for you uh, to clean your brushes with Gamsol or OMS, odorless mineral spirits, than it is turpentine. I don't use turpentine. It's just vapors and everything are just awful. Anyway, hope that answers your question. Oil paints, modern oil paints, if they've been made over the past 10, 15 years, are are mostly safe. And you're, again, you're not, you don't want to be painting and licking your fingers or licking your paintbrush before you... As long, but you know, so if you're using your head while you're painting, not very toxic. Um, you probably want to, if you're painting with oil paints, it's some, it has a bit of a strong smell, which some people find nauseating. Um, but it's generally not super toxic. You probably open your windows just because it can be. It just some people. I love the smell of oil paint. My wife hates it, <laughs> so. Anyway, uh, let's get back to the painting here. Let's finish this one off. Um, so I'm going to leave the clouds. I love the way the clouds look right now. Let's go on to the the this hand. And let's bring back this image. Oh, wow, whoa, where'd it go? Okay. I guess I can't get it. Oh, I know, there it is. I got it all in one. So, let's, um... I'm gonna mix... Uh, a little bit of a warm red. I'm gonna go right back into this area where I mixed this flesh tone. And... I'm just going to make it a little bit darker, as or just more red, I guess. But not just full-on red. And then... Hmm... Actually... I'm going to keep this paint on the brush, and I'm going to grab another brush, and I'm going to do the same thing but instead of I'm gonna go to some white mostly white 
I think this might be a little bit easier for some people. Maybe we just start doing some of these veins on here. And then I'm going to outline them with some darker colors here. Start painting all these wrinkles on the knuckles. And don't worry, like some of these brush strokes I'm putting down are kind of big and loud and gross. And just because we're doing some of the finer details in this Philip Guston painting doesn't mean we're gonna get all you know, we're we're gonna stop the expressive aspect of painting. You could tell again, I'm I could care less about making this exactly like the original, I would probably think this is would be, I, and I certainly, obviously, he's could care less about getting the anatomy correct in his own painting. So why would I obsess over that kind of stuff myself? All right. So that's using the mostly white for those kind of lines. I may decide to go back in and and add um, more white or something next to them. Now I'm going to go in here and kind of, this is sort of the shadowy side of some of these white lines. I think some of these lines are going to have to be much darker, but that's okay. I'd much rather start a little bit more conservatively and then kind of as I get the color that I like, or if I'm not happy with it, I can always darken them. And not only that, I like having multiple layers of paint here. Good stuff. Now, now let's just take a bit more warm red here. I'm even going to take a little bit of cool red, just mix some cool red into my red. And then let's just kind of go back up and where it feels appropriate. Keep in mind, these are big paintings. Like, this uh, this painting is probably, like, six feet tall. Right? It's, this is, like, this hand itself is bigger than a lot of people who would be standing in front of it. Right? So, these are... This is not a small painting. So, he's using big brushes. He's using his whole body to paint these kind of marks. Okay. 
Okay. That's even better. Let's take this even uh, up in one more notch. So we're going to take some of this uh, warm red. Take just a little bit of warm blue. That's going to help me get a darker red. It's almost a little bit like adding some of the cool red into this mixture. Now we are going to add some black here shortly. But not every part of this painting needs black. Like we don't want to put black into all these veins on the arm. It's going to look really funny if we do. So... So I'm going to take this warm red and start building it up. This darker warm red up in here. I love these pa these paintings are really unlike anything anyone had made up until this point. And you know, if it had been anyone else, it would have eh, people would have been like, I think it, it it may even have gotten forgotten. But the fact that it was made by one of the most important abstract painters of his time was just scandalous. Like, I, you know, we live in a, a period of time these days where I, I think our expectations of what art can do are is pretty low. Like, I don't think most people think that, um, like, most people would just sort of yawn. They'd be like, oh, okay, that's, like... Banksy is, is really probably is the most kind of controversial artist and you know for many people he's just like an interesting click on Instagram they don't get as kind of worked up about his art as you know an artist like um, Philip Gustin was like people were incensed and as I said his friends just could not wrap their heads around what he's doing. Okay. Likewise, I'm just gonna I'm gonna lighten it up just a little bit. Put a few lines. <laughs> oh, 
my goodness. It is a little bit more on the red side of things, or orangey inside there. It could have been a little bit more pinkish. Probably the color I had underneath there earlier was better. But, uh, yeah, it's okay. So, I think I'm going to... Actually, let's... Just before I was going to go right into the black. Let me just take a second. Let's look at the bottom down here. And I'm going to... Let's paint this darker color in. So, I think this was... Let's take a bit more blue. And warm red. And I like the kind of the brushiness here. I'm not going to... It's hard. It is really hard to keep yourself from going in there and continuing to mush that paint around. All right? So allow yourself to just like let go. All right? So let's just move that to the side for a second. Clean off some brushes. This one is very close to being done. I think we just, we're going to put some black on here and then do the the marks in the clouds. And then that should give us about an hour to finish off the other painting. Okay. Ah, good to see more likes there. I appreciate that. I think a lot of people... I forget to... Whenever I'm watching anything on YouTube, I just always... Even before the video starts, I just give it a like. Just because I know what it's like to be a YouTuber and to make videos and how important that can be to help a channel grow. So whenever I just tune into something, I'm like, hit the like button, boom, done. So let's take some of this black now. Ooh, right? We don't usually take black right out of the tube. Um, but in this case, I am going to do just that. So, oh, I see there's some white there. Actually, before I do this... I'm going to paint that... Uh, So I'm going to have to wait a little bit for that to dry. I painted it on a little bit thick, just in the spirit of Philip Gustin. I might have to wait for that to dry a little bit, but let's... Uh, this line, I think, is more straight, so... And don't worry about making it one nice, beautiful, straight line. Like, you see how mine kind of wobbles a little bit? Great. Done.
So we'll just have to be a little bit mindful of how we're doing some of this here. Where we put our black. I don't think we want to overdo it, so just kind of... Still very much wet this white. Hmm, I just noticed that there that white actually goes further up in between those fingers a little bit. I didn't notice that until now. So I'll have to decide as I'm you know working on this, do I want to do that? these little black lines that I'm putting here. Um, are smaller than the previous ones I did with the red. Noticing that I might want to take a little bit of a lighter color for these fingernails. doing that, I just I see a few places maybe where I... There's, a, I think, a few little touch-ups I'm going to make here with some a dark red. I'll just wait for some of this black to dry. Um, okay, so let's go up into the clouds and finish that off. Okay, so we're doing most of this with warm blue and maybe a bit of white. So it's going to take some white here. It's kind of, we won't go full on, but we're going to just go a little bit darker than probably most of the, the marks we had there thus far in the clouds were. And then let's see. Just start now. Kind of doing what we call like kind of almost like a cross hatch patterns. Oh yeah, we're gonna we should darken in there too. Underneath the there. It's interesting, you know, you you I 
I just see more and more every time I, I look at the painting. Curving lines. Some horizontal lines. So notice all these lines are sort of going in different directions, etc. Right? So just want to capture. There's like I just feel like he's moving around quickly. Like I can almost feel his body flying around this canvas. If you watch him painting, he's pretty aggressive with the way that he paints. Like he's you know, especially some of those towards the ver these paintings towards the very end, you know, he's what, how old he's in his Uh, late 60s, early 70s. You know, again, he was a big drinker. So, he looks like he's in his 80s or 90s towards the end. Um... Okay, I feel like I got the right hand side pretty well done. Just go over to the left here. So there's a lot more small details here. In fact, let's zoom in even more. Especially going to paint this line out a little bit, soften it.
slowly adding a little bit more blue to my brush. To get closer into this area here. Okay, and now I'm just going to take some black. I'm going to take a little bit of black and I'm going to mix a bit of it in with some blue. Opposite. I'm going to take some of this, uh, oops, black. Let's take some bit of, we'll just take some cool red since we got lots of that left. even a little bit of gray here. Lighten it up just a bit. Okay, I think we're almost done. So I just want to come back down here. And I just want to take uh, a darker red. This was our warm red with a little bit of warm blue.
Okay. I could keep on working on this one for a bit, but I think it's... Let's just take a look, zoom out, and see if we can live with it. <laughs> I, I quite like that. <laughs> um, you know, a little bit... I guess I could lighten that up right here. A little dark. Actually, maybe that's a little bit too light. Let's get a bit... I mean, I, I think I could f feel pretty happy walking away from this. Okay. So, that's... There's one. I, I'm pretty happy with that. There, is there a... It's not exactly perfect, but... Um... <laughs> that makes me so excited to see that. Um, I just never thought I would ever paint a Philip Guston painting. <sighs> yeah, my goodness, that is so cool to see. Okay, so let's. Uh, I'm gonna let this dry. There might, as I paint on it, I might go. Oh, you know what? I, f I noticed something else. I forgot there. So I'm just gonna give it a second. Let it. Let it uh, sit, and then I'm gonna um, we'll work on this other painting. So everything, the colors I think have dried, and they're a little bit darker than they originally uh, were. You know, paint when it's wet is often looks a little bit brighter than it is when it dries. So um, let's. Uh, I think we want to make this background even lighter. So this is uh, a cold magenta. Although it looks like there's a bit of warm red in there too, so. I think it's mostly, so I'm just gonna, we'll mix it up and we'll just see. That is a little bit closer. So it's 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 got warm red and cool red both in here. Gonna paint over that area. Um, so I'm just taking a color that's just almost a little bit darker and just going around and going into some of these areas as I as I do this to make sure because the, the brush strokes 
and maintaining those is like really one of the most important parts of this painting. So, nope. it's still got a bit of peachiness, doesn't it? Bit of peach. I'm gonna take a bit of warm yellow and mix it into that color. There we go. That's what we've been. That's what everyone has been asking for. Okay. I think I'm going to take even more of that peachy color. So this is some warm red or and a little bit of warm yellow in there. Basically I just want I just want it to look like his painting, right? With this kind of brushiness all over the place. Okay, I like that. Okay, so now, obviously, I can continue fussing around in there, but I don't, I don't, I don't think it's going to get appreciably better. I do want to just go back to the, to the curtains. I guess you'd, the, I think that's what they are, in the top. I'm gonna take, maybe allow my color to get a little bit darker. Okay, where else do I need some red? Let's do these, actually you know what, I should, let's paint the white first, because that'll be easier. It's easier to, to do often the, the under colors, so let's get to the colors that are a little bit in behind, I mean. So this, oops, that's too small.
So I'm being very um, quick with these brush strokes. I'm not. My goal is not to cover all of the colors I put down there already. I'm using white, but I'm kind of just being. It's almost like a lazy the way that I'm applying. In fact, that's almost too much that I put down there. So let's just. See if I can scoop up or brush some of this out. You know, I could do, so if I really wanted to kind of fake it out, I could use some glaze to do some of this, but. Um, I'll try to avoid some of that, I think. <laughs> cool. Um, now, what else do we want to do here? This area needs to be just a bit more white. This is probably one of the only times we're ever going to use some black and white to make a gray. Just since we've got black on our palette, usually you know that I like to mix my own colors. But here is even like a bit of, there was, I used this earlier. So there was some red in there anyway, so. save that the cigar or cigarette or whatever it is um, for a little bit here my red okay so let's now I'm gonna go and oh that wasn't quite f finished was it let's put a little more white This is, I just, you know, as I often don't bother washing my brush while I'm painting, so I got a bit of this gray in here. But I like that. Let's do the light bulb now. Let's see, it's a little bit lower than the clock, so it's somewhere right here.
this is the most carefully painted part of this whole painting so far the light bulb Okay, let's get these this hand painted in here now. That's great. Very excited. Um, let's see. There's some of these. I think there's a red paintbrush here. This next one's got a bit of orange in it. This one's got let's put that yellow down on the bottom right. Let's touch up the the easel. So let's I think I'm going to put a bit of, I think, cold yellow, just since I got so much of it. Um, Anywhere else for this color? I think that's good. Okay. So, I think we can start now putting a bit of black on here, which is going to change this painting quite dramatically really quickly. It's, it's worth just taking a, a couple seconds here just to clean a few of these brushes. It's interesting how like the I see the numbers of viewers going up, 
dramatically and then down dramatically and then up and then down I think some people tuning in out of curiosity Philip Guston is as I said for a lot of contemporary artists is is seen as like one of the the giants um, you know the bravery it took for him to transition from abstract painting to this type of painting is you know uh, the examples other examples you could think of would be people like the Beatles you know uh, going from the kind of the poppy boy band to experimental Sgt. Peppers um, Bob Dylan unplugging his guitar or plugging in his guitar from the acoustic folk guy into rock and roll Bob Dylan You know, both of uh, the Beatles and Bob Dylan certainly got a lot of um, anger from the true original fans when he when uh, they did that. I'm trying to think of another artist. You know, maybe like Taylor Swift. Or oh, Taylor Swift was like a country artist, wasn't she? And then she became a pop artist. I thought Taylor Swift was country beforehand, right? And again, people getting upset with that. Um, so you can never really make anybody happy, right? Especially as, like, an artist, you sometimes, like, get pushed into, like, a category that you may, you may enjoy for a point in time, and then you're like, yeah, I want to explore and try a few different things, and, um, not everybody is, uh, is as open-minded, and you can end up alienating a lot of people doing that. Okay, so... Let's just go right into it. Let's take um, our black. I'm going to get a little bit of red on this black so that you can see that he's... It's not entirely solid black all the time, especially because I'm going to start painting on, let's say, the hands. And we've got this brush that goes in fact let's zoom in on this area here Oh, I love that goopy painting. <laughs> oh, this makes me so excited. Uh, I can I know some people just cannot stand this type of painting. But I love it. I got you know, I think I I I love almost every kind I can't really think of a painting style that I don't like. You know, when I was younger, Certainly, I had I was very opinionated about what good art and bad art was, and I had no problems letting everybody who would listen know what I thought. And as I got older, eh, life's too short. You know, I, I'm and in fact, if anything, I have a great deal of respect for for. Um, different artists who use different styles and I just think like yeah it's great you know it's just one less thing that I have to do um, somebody's got that covered okay great there's something you know a style out there for everyone which is different than when you know when I first when I went to art school like I remember my teachers being really opinionated as to like what constituted art because some of my teachers were from the same generation of painters who who said that like um, who'd, who who would have like hated Philip Guston maybe that's why I liked because some of my teachers didn't um,
So it's just a bit of white on in that black, a bit of a grayish thing going on. I'm going to keep that little bit of a messy gray as we go forward here. So many people believe that this painting is a self-portrait and and because people believe it's a self-portrait the fact that he's wearing if it is a self-portrait I'm not exactly sure the fact that you know why on earth would he paint himself wearing the hood um, of the KKK Right? Does that mean, or I mean, some he also, because one of the reasons he, you know, originally he was painting uh, the KKK is because it was his own way of sort of commenting and protesting against the violence that he saw, literally saw them commit. Remember, they destroyed the LAPD, the 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 KKK members who were also police officers in the Los Angeles Police Department destroyed one of his paintings. So originally he was painting back in the 1930s images of them because he thought they were like these horrible villainous characters and he made murals about them like that. And then later on I think he his his views on these on this kind of change I think he, he saw the KKK as representing um, just evil in general, like evil incarnate. And so he used the, the hooded figure as like a stand-in for, um, for these evil people, right? But I think he also, I think as he was examining himself he saw that there's aspects of his own personality that could be seen as also evil right which is not something most of us want to think about uh, we don't want to even consider the possibility that there's evil inside of us evil is is reserved for bad guys right other people not us we're, we're good people but I think some of the guilt that he had from cheating on his wife and um, being a, a, a like a really desperate alcoholic, I think that um, you know, and basically abandoning his daughter for for a part of her childhood caused a great deal of depression, and. So I think he's he he could it wasn't too much of a stretch for him to think like yeah you know what there's parts a big part of me that is evil and you know maybe maybe I'm not such a better guy than these you know I'm not going around killing people but I've done a great deal of damage to my family and I th and so I think that's why he started to he found it hard to make that distinction between the evil out there and the the evil inside him which is you know again one of those things reasons why that younger generation of artists kind of gravitated towards him because they were just like wow that that takes a lot of courage to admit that about yourself and to to try to come to terms with some of the negative things that he the damage he caused during his own life and subsequently, a lot of art in the 
not really 90s or 80s, but as we get into the 1990s, becomes a lot more self-aware and artists making art about themselves and their own personal struggles and um, so those artists like mining the unconscious and um, for for them Gustin was like was a hero because he was confronting his own inner demons There's also an aspect of this, you know, these these hands, they have a cartoony look, like these, this red that I'm painting on here, this reminds me a lot of Mickey Mouse's hands, right? Mickey Mouse, a lot of cartoons use these kind of sausage-like uh, fingers to represent, like, hands, because animating hands is very time-consuming, so they would just use these little stumpy gloves to um, to stand in for hands. Oops. Just fiddling around down here. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's keep. Let's go back up to where we are in the picture. I painted that a little bit dark, this gray in there. I don't mind it though, so I'm just gonna embrace it and keep on trucking. I'd say we're about 30 minutes from being all done, depending on how things go. I would love to see your versions of, of today's paintings uh, and see how they turned out and how you feel about painting in this particular style. It's not for everyone. Not everybody likes uh, this very expressive way of painting. Scared me for a second there. The lights it's coming on and off. Um,
it is kind of sad that his his work has created this bit of a controversy of people who are angry and think that his work is this he's depicting glorifying this racist imagery it's not surprising entirely um but uh You know, it does seem like a bit of a... It's a sign of our contemporary times where people are... Maybe rightfully so... Have a... Are... are, um, uh, You know, laser focused... To... To kind of right some wrongs. But sometimes things sort of... People who mean well... Maybe have maybe misunderstand sort of the the idea or motivation behind some artworks, but you know it is in some ways it, it makes me happy to think that that art can still um, uh, elicit emotions from people. Sometimes I, I wonder, like, oh, man, like, kind of like Philip Gustin, like, is, what's the purpose of doing this? You know, like, what's the purpose of making art, and can I actually affect any change? And then, honestly, when I hear some of the feedback from people watching who get really excited about their own personal growth making this kind of art, this, I was like, yeah, okay, there's still, like, we can... No, um, there, there's a art serves a, a useful purpose, and um, so I'm just gonna. This is a bit more orangey. Let's stay there for a bit. Okay. Let's go back to our dark. It's just sort of jumping around here. Um, obviously. One of the things I like about this, you know, is, is it is just, it's, I think, very freeing painting in this way, especially, we haven't really painted in this type of a manner before, so. Um, because I don't think there's, there's that much of a demand from it from beginner artists, I think. Even though these paintings aren't particularly complicated, I think most beginners usually begin painting because they want to paint things that look like other things, I guess you could say. And uh, Philip Guston's paintings don't really look like things. They're, they're, they're pretty bizarre and... and um, So, okay.
this bottom line down here. I think I'm going to paint it again with, uh, with some more white. Afterwards, let's put this line down in there. And then let's come up to the face. Close here, right? So we're just let's if we want to figure out where these eyes are, you can see they're kind of line up with the top of the the easel or the, the canvas that's on the easel. I can see a little bit of my pencil lines underneath there. Got all these funny little dots on here, I think these are intended to be kind of like little stitches in the like seams on on the on this fabric. So, actually, let's, I'm going to just clean a few brushes for a second here. Paula says, the arts are giving me a new life after retirement, especially in this pandemic time. Thanks, Michael. See, that makes me so excited to hear, right? Like how making art would make us feel like uh, re rejuvenated, like they have a new purpose, and um, that's awesome. That makes me so happy to hear, Paula. That's really cool. And after all, isn't it like we're all kind of looking for meaning and purpose in life, and um, if making art can be one of those things that helps you feel like you have um, a role to give. Like even it's like I, I love washing the dishes, and and uh, I say to my my wife, oh sorry, you made all this big mess, and I'm like, I love it. I love waking up and washing dishes. Makes me feel like. I have some use in our family, <laughs> and that, uh, you know, if I don't wash the dishes, you know, yes, my wife could just get a dishwasher, like a machine, or maybe like a really handsome young guy to come and wash the dishes, I guess, um, if I were to suddenly drop dead. Um, but I feel like, well, at least while I'm alive, I'm contributing in my own small way to the functioning of this household. <laughs> uh. Oh, I want to like, brighten up this green. So we're getting we're like really close. Like, um, let's take a look at. 
this. Let's go to the light bulb. Another thing I think about with Philip Guston is the economy of marks here, right? There's there's not a lot of marks on, like, or the, unlike, even just the Fortnite painting we did just the other day, or yesterday, I guess, it feels like, yeah, I've been making paintings almost every day this month, um... Like, he's able to convey some of this information so quickly for us. And and it, it definitely is what helps... It makes people think that there's lots of meaning to... The, everything becomes very iconic. Like, very much like... Uh, iconic meaning, like, you know, like the sign... Like a bathroom sign that has, like, a man or a woman. Or... Um, you know, a sign at the airport for taxis. You know, it's like everything becomes highly symbolic. You know, he his his parents were from Ukraine, and they emigrated to Canada in the early like around nineteen twelve or something, right around there to escape the persecution. They were Jewish, remember? So they're trying to escape the persecution in Europe. Like, you know, my, my father's side of the family is Ukrainian as well. Um, and I've got, when I was growing up, I was good friends with a lot of other little Ukrainian boys. And I've got to tell you, um... Many Ukrainian families were, uh, like, um, very, very racist. <laughs> like, it's just, like, I remember some of the th things people would say, you know, and just being, like, just shocked, because my parents didn't talk that way. And, um... So, um, where was I going with this racism talk? Well, I guess they immigrated to Canada to get away from not only just the racism in in Eastern Europe or Europe altogether, but like the, literally the fear of being murdered, right? Which became very real a couple decades later with the Holocaust, right? Oh, I, I remember. Okay, so a big, you know, so some of these symbols that he's using, like, uh, you don't really see it in these paintings, but there's a, in many of his other paintings, you see lots of shoes and legs that are sticking up out of the ground um, and they're piled together and many people interpret that as being him commenting on the Holocaust itself and so these paintings that just look really silly and goofy for him have a great deal of meaning and if anything he saw them as having way more meaning and, and way more intensely personal than his abstract paintings. Which is also often abstract painters, a big part of it is they, they deliberately did not want to have meaning in there. They wanted it to be um, meaningless. Obviously that's pretty hard to do. Because um, people will read meaning into anything. Uh, oh yeah, we 
everybody. <laughs> this light bulb's just floating in the air. So I think I'm gonna do the light bulb on its own here. I'm just gonna rotate my canvas. And I'm pretty close to being done. I think I got the smoke left to do. And then that's it. So I'm even going to, I don't usually do this, but just so people see kind of, um, I'm going to just draw a pencil line. You know, whatever you need to do to help you make your painting. So let's zoom out. Wow. That's fun. Okay. Um, let's see. So what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm whoop. I'm starting to get ready to do uh, kind of some finishing touches down here. Let's get. I'm painting up there was a there was a white there was a circle down here. So I'm just gonna paint that out. I drew. I'll let that dry for a second. While that's drying, let's work on the green by the window. So let's take our cool yellow, cool blue. Let's make this color again, much more yellowy, much more bright green. In fact, let's put a little bit of white in here. It's almost a little bit too bright now. Maybe I didn't need this, that. I didn't put too much white in there, but it definitely got quite bright. Um. Oops, sorry, bumping the microphone.
widening this fingers. It was driving me nuts. this dark line. I'm going to take a bit of that green and just paint Okay, so let's do that smoke now. That smoke is uh, black and white, obviously. So gray. I've just got a bit of red there on my brush, kind of accidentally, but kind of like it. So it's kind of coming up. Get a bit of black on here. Let's just get a bit of white on there as well. a little bit of black. Okay. Am I missing anything? I was going to fix this up down here. Let's get some more white on this light bulb. grayish color. Um, okay, let's mix. I'm going to put a, um, a... I'm going to take some warm red from the and go back to this orange, or the warm yellow from the very beginning. This is just going to go down the drain in a few minutes. And paint that back down on the bottom. Take a bunch more yellow. Be more yellow, but 
Maybe I'll do that afterwards. That could be even a little more blue. How much of these little details do I want to finagle with over and over and over again? I'm not so sure. Oh yeah, I was going to do, I need to blow dry down here. Maybe add a bit of white. See if I can just add uh, some white. I'm going to paint this much larger. It's going to be where I'm going to put his signature right in here. Okay, so very close to being done. I'm going to blow dry that. Sorry, I turned the volume. Okay. Just need a bit more. Just taking a bit of warm yellow. I just want to brush it over some of this down here in the bottom. want this, yeah, to be a little bit more on the orangey 
side. It really come, comes forward when it's a bit more orangey. That was a little too, too, too orangey. So put a little bit of red into it and it just mutes it a tiny bit. I'm just going to do the the window a little bit darker blue. Maybe not quite that light. Mm, now it's a bit too gray. Sometimes you mix a color and you're like, no, just, just not quite what I want. Because I, I also try to use up as many of these colors that I have on the palette by the end. So I'm looking, is there any more white on here? So I don't have to use any more. I mean, minor, minor change. And then I'll be almost done here. I'm just going to paint his signature. That's still a little wet, so let's blow dry that. Okay, let's um I guess it was a little yellowy, isn't it too? And it is a nice I like that. Let's merge, let's put a bit of this is just some cool yellow on top of that white. Maybe could have been a little bit more light with that, but... Let's see, the way that he does this is he's got, ah, uh, 
Well, I'm, see, I'm pulling paint that's not fully dry off of the canvas. Almost out of paint here. That's why it's a little bit sticky and goopy, and it's not behaving the way I want it to. Okay. Am I done? I think I'm done. Um. <laughs> Such a weird painting. Oh my goodness. Uh, there's that. And then let's look at the previous one. Hopefully we don't need to do anything to this one. And then this side went to... Two paintings by Philip Guston, one of the great painters. He was born in Canada, lived most of his life in the United States. A person who fearlessly took on the Ku Klux Klan and the Los Angeles Police Department, then fearlessly switched to abstract expressionist painting like his good friend Jackson Pollock and then when he felt that it no longer was communicating what he wanted to switched a third time and began painting in the style that we see here today the style that he's probably today most famous for so let's uh Put some signatures on these paintings here. So this would have this the line. This is I didn't realize this was definitely one of his last paintings. Look at that, get dirty, dirty fingers right on the front of the painting, Michael. You say you're done, but you just. Mm, I gotta use more white. I was hope. Sometimes you just feel like ah. Oh, Done, right? Nope. Look at that. 
didn't even take the cap off when I tried to squeeze the paint out. Amateur hour here, over here. Try not to get as much paint on this one. <laughs> I mean, the best thing to do is to sign any of your work after it's dry. But I try to do this while we're on camera. Okay, everyone. Well, thanks for joining me for another episode. Tomorrow, we're gonna, again, this is a lot of painting this week. Tomorrow, we're going to be making a painting of the best soccer player who ever lived. She's still playing. She's going to be playing during this Olympics. She played just the other day, scored another goal. More goals than any man or woman has ever scored in international soccer. Christine Sinclair. And I'm so excited to make a painting... Um, based on her because I think she's a super inspiring person and I think about these things it's like what are the kind of images I want our daughter who's uh, turning two in three weeks so I think like what kind of images do I want her to be surrounded with as she grows up in paintings of some of the greatest female athletes artists musicians that kind of thing those are the things I think that I want her to, to be surrounded with so that it makes her feel like um, there's limitless possibilities, right? Okay, so thanks everyone for joining me again. Uh, if you haven't, please like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell. I know people sometimes are like, when is the video coming up? Every time I put up new videos, just hit the notification bell. That way, as soon as you log into YouTube, you can find out, it just, it'll tell you when I'm live and you don't have to do any hard searching to find any of these things um, and uh, yeah if you want to contribute a small amount via PayPal the link is down below you can also send me a check or money order contact me through uh, the Facebook group upload your version of the Facebook group we'll see you guys in a couple of days or I guess tomorrow right my goodness we are gonna also make a painting on Sunday or Sunday or Saturday Sunday Attila Richard Lukacs, another a very different Canadian artist uh, to celebrate Vancouver Pride. So thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you guys in, a, in uh, 24 hours or less. Enjoy your time, and we'll see you soon. Good night, everybody.